and because many readers will still be familiar with it. A statute mile is our regular land mile and is around 0.87 of a geographical mile. To assist the reader, where a quote includes geographical miles, I have endnoted the equivalent distance in statute miles, simply times by 1.15. For example, if you are located at 88 degrees 57 minutes south, you are 1 degree and 3 minutes, and therefore 63 geographical miles from the pole, 90 degrees south. And 63 by 1.15 equals 72.5 statute miles. There are minor variations in the lengths of geographical miles because the Earth is not a perfect sphere and different organisations adopted different standards. For the purposes of this book, these may be ignored, as the differences are minuscule. Also, because it is what they employed at the time, I have used the Fahrenheit system to measure the temperatures, as opposed to Celsius. Prologue What shall we say of our Douglas as an acknowledged leader and organiser? This, I will say, that if there be a corner of this planet of ours still unexplored, Douglas Mawson will be the organiser and leader of an expedition to unveil its secrets. Speech given by the Fort Street Model School's headmaster, Boss Turner, to a school assembly in the late 1890s. It was in the time before the dream time, nigh on 800 million years before people walked the earth. A great and devastating cold, the coldest cold the world has known, fell upon the land we now know as Australia. The snow tumbled down, the winds howled, the blizzards blew, the rivers froze, and such primitive organisms as had then evolved perished hard. In some parts, the land was simply submerged beneath an enormous cap of ice over four miles thick. As the snow continued to fall, decade after decade, century after century, for millennia, and became part of that ice cap, gravity caused the vast rivers of ice to flow slowly, slowly, oh, so slowly, out and down to the sea. For tens of millions of years, the ice held the land in its terrible frozen grip, until slowly, inexorably, sufficient warmth returned and it melted away. Where once there had been only snow and ice and howling blizzards, the earth gradually reappeared, and only a few million years later, creeping plant life began to appear, followed by slightly more evolved organisms. Over the next 500 million years, the Earth's glaciers twice reappeared, though it was never quite so cold again. Around 50 million years ago, the outline of the island continent finally became recognisable. Australia began to drift northwards with its evolving cargo of flora and fauna. The centre of the continent began to desiccate, to lose even the barest hint of moisture, for where once there had been glaciers and snow, there was instead sheer, white, blinding heat. The freezing wind had so ceased to shriek that the searing sun above not only shone, it pulsed, and the land became desert. Yet that massive pressure of ice for all those millions of years in that time before the dream time had made its mark. The moving ice had scoured and gouged the land beneath, plucking up rocks and boulder clay from far away and polishing them smooth before dropping them hundreds of miles from their source. Elsewhere, the signature parallel scratches of moving glaciers remained on the rocks to tell expert eyes something of what once was there. Such an expert is the 25-year-old Douglas Mawson on this hot day in late September 1907. Yes, severe the landscape might be in these Flinders Ranges in the north of South Australia, just to the west of Broken Hill, with not a fleck of green to leaven the sheer burnt redness of it all. But, entirely ignoring the madness of being out in the midday sun in this manner, Mawson is a man in his element. A large fellow of strong build and athletic movement, and yet with the intelligent expression of one who is lost in a world of intense reverie.